I'm really happy to be here. It's my first time. Um, I'll try to do better with my Portuguese translations. This is fine, I know, but unfortunately this is the only slide that I managed to get it put on to, so uh, we'll go from there. Uh, I've been at the University of Rochester since 1987 and directing their HIV vaccine clinical trials uh, uh, site uh, since 1991. Uh, what I uh, am going to uh, uh, talk to you about today, uh, pathways to a preventive HIV vaccine, I, I probably should subtitle that within the next five to ten years. I'm going to limit my uh, talk pretty much to uh, products that are already in the vial for uh, human uh, clinical trials. And just getting to that point is a tremendous achievement and uh, takes a long time and a lot of money. Uh, perhaps we could even have Dr. Evans give a uh, uh, perspective from the pharmaceutical side or the development side. There's, there's uh, tremendous challenges before you get uh, from, from the uh, you know, compelling studies in uh, non-human primates uh, then into, into human volunteers. So, what I'm going to do is try to just run, give you a quick kind of overview. I realize that a lot of you are, are students, and so I, I'm not predisposing necessarily a whole lot of uh, background knowledge in the, the clinical vaccinology field. So, uh, let's go from there. Uh, I've been a member of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network since its inception in uh, 2000. And as I mentioned before that, I was with the, uh, the uh, previous organization supported by the NIH to do clinical trials. And this is where our, our sites are right now. I had previously worked with Esper here in Sao Paulo uh, in a site partnering uh, uh, relationship uh, a, a few years ago as part of the, the HVTN. And uh, he really didn't need a whole heck of a lot of mentoring, or maybe only needed about a week's worth, and then he was fine to go. But uh, we've developed a re relationship through that, as well as his previous time that he spent with us in, in Rochester. So these uh, orange dots are all the clinical sites uh, that are around the world. Uh, statistical centers in Seattle, uh, uh, Washington, at the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Research uh, Center, uh, also, the central labs are there, as well as at Duke, which is somewhere in there. And then there's a new uh, 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 Cape Town uh, central laboratory that has, uh, within the past couple of years, been, been established. I wanted to uh, echo, I think, something that Tom said uh, before about TB vaccines. Uh, while we'd love to have a perfect vaccine, uh, even a, a partially effective vaccine, could, uh, could make a difference in the, uh, in the epidemic, uh, even with uh, relatively marginal coverage. As you see here, uh, 20, 30, 40 percent isn't, isn't really great coverage, but it could uh, result in, in uh, a number of lives uh, uh, saved. And uh, this is an old slide. I'm sure the, the modeling is, is slightly different. It doesn't take into account of PrEP, but you know, PrEP uptake has at least and it's come along in the U.S. Uh, I'm not sure. I get, you probably have prep pretty widely here in, in, uh, in uh, Brazil. But, uh, but, but still, uh, any, any uh, hint of ef efficacy we can find uh, can be a big plus. In, in particular, we can build upon that to try to understand mechanisms of uh, protection or lack of protection. So uh, just kind of for your students, uh, really, uh, Developing vaccines it can kind of be seen uh, a very similar way, uh, whether it's HIV vaccines, Zika vaccines, uh, Ebola vaccines, or what have you. Uh, our colleagues at the VRC and at the NIH uh, do a particularly good job at that, that with uh, uh, using uh, common vaccine platforms and, uh, and just uh, uh, adjust the, uh, the inserts to the, uh, the pathogen of, uh, of interest. Uh, adjuvants also is a very important uh, uh, area that could benefit all the areas of vaccine development. So this isn't tremendously different than TB vaccine development. A lot of uh, uh, cross-fertilization across the fields, and I, I would even encourage even more of that uh, together because we, we really can't remain siloed uh, in this uh, fiscal uh, realities of the world uh, these days. So we need to, to try to do more together. I don't need to 
convince anyone, and this is an old slide, but the, really the diversity of the virus is the, uh, the, the, really the biggest challenge and, and always uh, has been. Uh, okay, uh, HIV genomes differ by that much, and uh, actually human genomes differ from chimpanzees by 1%, so you can imagine how, how different these things uh, look. So uh, this is a slide I've adapted. Really, in, in my mind, HIV is a, a master of disguise, uh, very highly uh, glycosylated, uh, sugar-coated, uh, relatively sparse GP120 knobs on the, uh, the surface of the virion, along with self-protein. Uh, so it's really designed to evade uh, particularly neutralization. And uh, over the years, we've, uh, uh, we, meaning the, the royal we have found uh, the uh, uh, particular uh, critical epitopes that uh, are required that monoclonal antibodies have now been developed, and you'll hear more about that in the therapeutic ses uh, setting uh, from the next uh, speaker, Rebecca. So, in general, there's uh, kind of three approaches to uh, HIV vaccines, and uh, I think from the very beginning, we'd all love to have this. Uh, neutralizing antibodies have been really uh, the cornerstone of correlates of protection for most of the other antiviral vaccines, or they've been the ones we detected and recognized as, as being, being the, the, the correlate. We, once we get an effective vaccine, we really don't spend all that much more time digging into uh, why it works exactly. Uh, of course, there's the uh, T-cell approach, which uh, the HVTN, the clinical field, jumped full-fledged into uh, in the, uh, I guess that would be about the uh, late 90s and early uh, uh, two, uh, 2000s uh, with the Merck vaccines, the ad 5 uh, vectored vaccines. I'll mention a little bit about how that turned out. And then, and, uh, lo and behold, uh, we found that perhaps uh, antibodies have different influences rather than just uh, neutralization. Um, what's that? <laughs> Did I push a wrong button or something? Time for an ad. A short commercial advertisement on, uh, we got a, okay, good. All right, well, back to the talk. Did I do that or? I leaned on that or something? Okay, sorry. Whoa. This talk is brought to you by Microsoft. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so one thing I would, you know, to, to the, uh, you know, people that don't think a lot about this, uh, just, just a, a way our, our studies are uh, designed. Everybody knows you've got to go through the phase one, two, three uh, um, to get to licensure. And uh, we've recognized uh, pretty early on that we, we don't have a correlate. We don't know precisely in, in the human uh, 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 instance, what, what exactly we're looking for as far, far as uh, protection. So we've converted from the early days to doing uh, licensure phase three trials to uh, smaller phase two B trials. And uh, the, the line here really depicts the, uh, the volunteers that we recruit for these studies. In the smaller studies, they're uh, people who are at low or no risk for HIV infection. Um, generally between 18 and uh, 50 years of age, relatively pretty healthy, uh, probably very healthy, uh, because uh, drug uh, developers don't, or vaccine developers don't want uh, any, any sort of uh, safety signal that might be due to uh, 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 um, other things that happen in people's lives. So really here we uh, uh, draw blood and increasingly uh, do mucosal sampling, and even more recently, do some tissue sampling in some uh, intensive, uh, smaller, much smaller uh, phase one studies to try to understand the, uh, you know, like the development of uh, B cells through pl uh, plasma, uh, uh, plasma sites and uh, 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 in uh, various tissues. But uh, that's, uh, we're really just at the beginning of that. Uh, I'd like to do more of that. I think really the intensive small studies are, are, are necessary, even though they're pretty underpowered uh, to tell us a whole lot of anything, but it can give us a lot of uh, clues moving forward, I would think. And then really what we're doing mostly these days are these phase 2B studies. Uh, they're quicker, they're, even though they're expensive, they're less expensive than, than licensure trials. People at high risk uh, for uh, HIV, 
and really we're looking at endpoints of infection or modulation of infection after infection and that sort of thing. Ultimately, you've got to get to phase three uh, to license. So uh, that's the, the ultimate goal. Kind of being in the field for so long, I've kind of got a gestalt for uh, the types of uh, immunogens that we can use uh, to create the types of uh, antibody responses we, or uh, immune responses we might want. So uh, as far as uh, antibody production go, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, uh, glycoproteins or protein uh, vaccines are are the best at that. Uh, as I sort of mentioned early on, uh, the uh, envelopes were all monomeric and uh, did not, well, do, did not uh, uh, neutralize primary isolates. They're very good at neutralizing their, themselves, but not uh, uh, community isolates. And early on when this was uh, discovered how the, uh, the, the native uh, 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 GP120 is really a trimer or oligomer, uh, we stopped looking at this. Um, and um, so a lot of work was done with these monomeric proteins uh, for the first uh, decade and a half, and then they've kind of come back uh, by virtue of uh, the TIE trial uh, results uh, to look at non-neutralizing uh, uh, mechanisms of protection. And then, of course, uh, the, the goal is to get to uh, uh, more native-appearing uh, proteins, uh, oligomeric, trimeric, or scaffolded, uh, scaffolded uh, envelopes. And that is really just coming into the clinic uh, now uh, or last year and hoping that this can influence uh, uh, broadly neutralizing uh, activities. So just a reminder that uh, an antibody, they have different functions. We, we like neutralization a lot, as I mentioned but obviously there are other uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, antibodies uh, can uh, uh, do. Now, t as far as T cell responses, we found that uh, the uh, uh, live vectors uh, generally uh, are, are better with that. We've been through pretty much all of these uh, pox viruses at one time or another, adenoviruses, and uh, VSV is the, the uh, uh, most uh, recent uh, um, uh, vector uh, that's made an appearance in the clinical field, and then also plasma DNA uh, vaccines. Um, some of these pr produce better CD4 uh, responses, some produce CD8. AD5 is, I think, by far the, the best at uh, producing CD8 cells in our, our volunteers. And uh, um, DNA, we, we find that by itself uh, does not produce much antibody responses can produce a little bit of CD8, not much, uh, more CD4. Uh, and then there's a variety of ways you can modify DNA vaccines by delivery methods uh, or using uh, electroporation. And this is a, an example of the Novio electroporation device, uh, which uses electrical current for the uptake of the vaccine into cells. So uh, we probably should talk about this. Uh, this, this is, uh, even though these are the, the large expensive trials, the, these are the trials that we've been able to go back and get hints uh, as to mechanisms of uh, how they did or didn't work. The early days, uh, uh, the VaxGen uh, studies, uh, no efficacy uh, at all. Um, these were done in different, uh, more, well, this was done in a pure ID you, uh, uh, using group in, uh, in Thailand. Um, the, uh, the initial AIDS VAC study in the Americas uh, uh, was uh, mixed between MSM and high-risk females. It really turned out that the vast majority of them were, were MSM. Then we'll talk more about the, the Thai trial which did give us some uh, signal, uh, perhaps. And uh, of course, the STEP trial uh, produced very good CD8 uh, activity, uh, did not include envelope uh, in it. It was kind of during that time that we didn't really feel we, we knew enough about envelope or, or how to make uh, uh, antibodies that were, would, uh, would potentially be helpful. So uh, that, as you know, uh, proved to have no efficacy and uh, even a potential increase in acquisition uh, risk in, in its recipients uh, who are uh, AD5 negative and uncircumcised. Uh, H HVTN 503 was essentially the sister protocol of the STEP trial, uh, started off in uh, South Africa, uh, was stopped early when the results of the STEP trial came out. And then HVTN 505, uh, Danny Duick uh, uh, talked about that yesterday. 
And uh, no efficacy it was a DNA followed by a, uh, uh, ad 5 that did include uh, uh, envelope. Um, now, this didn't, didn't show any efficacy with respect to the vaccine, but I think uh, Danny's talk yesterday was very important in to show what can potentially be learned from uh, these negative trials, uh, not so much about the vaccine necessarily, but, but about the population who we're studying. And granted, uh, he probably got a lot of money to do all those assays uh, uh, that isn't available, easily available to the rest of us. Uh, our networks, uh, HVTN, uh, in particular, is, is eager to share data from old studies and, and, uh, um, and even samples. Trouble is you need kind of your own funding to do that. So we, we're developing a, a quite a uh, large uh, uh, warehouse of data and samples that can be looked back into that are open to the public uh, for uh, use. So I'd encourage uh, you to uh, uh, consider looking back into that if you would, uh, if you would uh, be so inclined. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the passive immunization strategy that we're looking at right now that's in uh, the clinic in a phase uh, 2B study. And uh, this will be talked about in the next uh, uh, talk as well too. So from those early days of just a few monoclonals or, or a few uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies there, are a lot more of them uh, these days, and uh, um, one, of, one of which, uh, VRC01, is being uh, used in a, uh, a two-part, uh, really it was the same trial, but uh, for regulatory reasons we had to split it into the uh, African side and the uh, uh, America side. Um, this is a collaboration between our network and the HIV prevention trials uh, network, as you can see there. So if you're a clinician, uh, using passive immunization is not all that unusual. It's not all that common. Perhaps the most common use is in pedi pediatrics with uh, high-risk uh, infants or premature infants uh, who get sick during RSV season used uh, uh, fairly frequently for that. Uh, other forms that I can probably say I recall prescribing in the past, I haven't really done rabies uh, at all, but uh, VZIG on, on occasion, and, and certainly some immune serum, uh, uh, immune serum globulin for a variety of indications. So it's not unusual that you might develop a product uh, for this. How exactly we're going to use it might be a, a good question. The uh, monoclonal in question is VRC01, uh, um, and it was developed at the uh, Vaccine Research Center, which we've had uh, a few uh, people from there giving talks here. And uh, in the laboratory, it's been able to block about 90% of the different uh, types, but I'll show you the, uh, a slide on its potency in a, in a few slides. Um, so why do we want to do this? Okay, it's, it may become a form of prevention. Uh, it could even become a form of long-acting prep, uh, uh, possibly, particularly if they can bring the, the cost down to making monoclonals. Um, so can, can supple, uh, uh, supplement uh, real-world applications. Uh, our, our interest, uh, somewhat, is to uh, also uh, teach us about uh, um, the level of a, a neutralizing antibody uh, detectable in the serum that m might be required for uh, protection from natural infection. Uh, in a way, this can be kind of looked at as, as uh, uh, validating uh, some of the, both the neutralization assays and uh, the animal studies that are, that are looking at uh, neutralization as well, too. And so kind of be used uh, to help us uh, develop, ultimately, an immunogen that uh, uh, may uh, uh, have broadly neutralizing uh, capabilities. Dr. DeRosier is going to be talking later this morning about, I believe, uh, incorporating this into a gene therapy of approach with AAV. So uh, I think this trial will, will be helpful to, uh, to help guide uh, the field with that. Uh, the study uh, schema is, uh, um, as you see here, uh, the uh, M M uh, uh, Americas in Europe, uh, Anna's 2700, and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, due to greater uh, uh, incidence uh, there, uh, it's women only there, uh, MSM and transgendered. 
uh, um, at higher risk for or HIV infection. Now, this, this is an IV uh, infusion trial, which is probably the last time this will ever be done. It's not very practical. Uh, I think future approaches will, will be going into using uh, sub-Q uh, administration uh, if uh, you know, this is to be followed up upon. Infusion is every eight weeks, so if you kind of look at this like a long-acting form of PrEP, uh, you know, that, that may be uh, viable, and, and um, you know, the study duration is, is uh, 22 months. Two, two different uh, dosing uh, levels, which largely the levels in PK studies over, overlap about 60% of the time. Uh, this is an interesting uh, concept, so what do we do about PrEP? In, in the U.S., certainly PrEP is standard of care, and we don't have it as a uh, standard of care controlled trial between, between the, uh, the monoclonal and uh, PrEP. We are allowing the use of PrEP. Um, for people who want to during the course of the trial, and, and the size is designed such that uh, we can account for uh, some, you know, some of the decrease in incidence that may be uh, due to uh, PrEP, also being able to measure uh, uh, Truvada levels in our, our participants. In other parts of the country, uh, the, uh, uh, or the world, uh, PrEP is, is less available, not standard of care, so in, in Peru, and I, I and I guess here in Brazil, where there's a Rio site that's uh, participating in this, in this study. Um, there are just more demonstration projects. And then certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, while PrEP is uh, approved, uh, practically speaking, rolling it out uh, is going to be tough when they've only cut a half rolled out uh, antiretrovirals in general to their infected population. Uh, this is a bit of a moving target as better forms of PrEP happen. It may make our uh, trials very uh, difficult to do with uh, vaccines and other forms of prevention. I think we're just going to have to see how that goes and, you know, it could require much larger trials, um, which are more expensive and perhaps one of the reasons to get, uh, get moving uh, now. Now, some, some of you follow HIV vaccine fields understand that one of the kind of the biggest concerns our volunteers have about the uh, being in our studies is the, the risk of uh, vaccine-induced seropositivity. Um, so you get an HIV vaccine, it develops antibodies, which is kind of what we want, but remember everybody uh, pretty much uses serology for detection of infection. So you can imagine in, in particularly in the de developing world uh, setting, it may cause a, a lot of confusion. And, but at least with VRC01, this does not show up any of the commercially available uh, 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 kits, and, and therefore it's, it's more attractive to our volunteers for that reason. I did want to finish off this section by, by talking about a uh, future, uh, the way this might go in the future, and this is a, st a study looking at uh, um, broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, in clade uh, C infections. Uh, this is just to show that uh, uh, the uh, neutralizing capacities of uh, IC50s or IC90s were, were looked at. Best-in-class uh, examples were, were chosen as far as uh, neutralizable, uh, uh, neutralizing uh, abilities. And this is the slide I really wanted to get to, is that uh, with a combination of two of these kind of newer generation uh, monoclonals, um, the, uh, uh, the, the concentration uh, required for uh, IC80 is shifted way downward as compared to VRC01. So VRC01 is really a, a test of concept trial. Uh, probably would be my guess is uh, you know, in the future a, a, a couple of, uh, probably uh, three of these uh, would be used in, in combination. But uh, that's my speculation. I'm just going to say one word about uh, the T-cell vaccine approach. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the Merck Ad 5 study was pretty much all about that, um, but I you know, will mention uh, what Dr. Evans had mentioned about the uh, uh, CMV vector as uh, producing uh, lifelong uh, uh, ac ac activity, uh, and uh, this study by Lewis Picker and, and his group is uh, uh, associated with a lot of excitement in the field and may indeed end up being, being the cornerstone. I do know that uh, as far as getting into the clinic, it's, uh, 
got a little over a year probably before that time, and, and it's uh, yet to be determined exactly what regulatory hurdles they'll be facing. So I just wanted to mention this. I'm not going to say a lot about this uh, because I am limiting this talk to things that are in, in the vial. So not quite yet for humans. I'm going to spend the rest of the time on uh, what we've sort of stumbled over uh, with the TIE trial. I think everybody knows about this. This is now out for uh, quite a while and in, in some of the lives of our, our uh, audience is kind of ancient history. To me, it was just like the last success we had, which was a while ago, but anyhow. Uh, this is conducted in, uh, in the uh, uh, two provinces in, in uh, Thailand. It was a, a general uh, community risk of HIV infection. So people didn't tend to be at very high risk. They did include people who were MSM and, and IV drug users, but it was just a, a general, all, all, all comers were uh, um, um, uh, enrolled. Um, it began in 2004, vaccinations completed in 2006, and trial then concluded in 2009. Uh, this is the uh, uh, regimen that I think, uh, and, and the vaccines, that I think are pretty well known. It was basically an ALVAC canary pox, which really on its own, or with the boost in the trials in the Americas, didn't produce enough immune responses to really uh, get us in the U.S. to move forward to a uh, phase 2B or 3. But uh, really the Thai uh, government uh, uh, really pushed to kind of keep this going. We didn't have a correlate. We really didn't know. And uh, so they were very supportive of doing this. So it was an LVAC at uh, 0136, which is in the, uh, the green, and then a uh, uh, recombinant uh, AIDSVAX BE uh, uh, GP120 uh, boost at three and six months. I did um, put this little asterisk up here. As this is the time that a lot of these correlates, uh, 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 that there was a, ser a serum and cell bank, or particularly a cell bank. So a, a lot of the results, uh, post hoc analysis that looked at uh, this to uh, tease out uh, mechanisms for uh, potential protection are, are largely from that optimal time point. Uh, as we recall, a uh, total of 125 uh, infections, uh, uh, better efficacy early, separating the curves there. Uh, the, the antibody levels did drop off uh, pretty drastically around 12 months. That could potentially explain uh, some of the differences. But uh, as we know in vaccinology, how you design the trial is how you analyze it. And while you'd like to pick and choose the results you like best, uh, the ultimate efficacy was judged to be 31% uh, 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 according to the, uh, uh, the, the protocol, pre predefined uh, uh, endpoints. Uh, also should mention, uh, in one of the first post-hoc analyses with this, was looking at who exactly was infected. And, and these were uh, people who were in the low or medium risk uh, group. A little bit hard to define. I, I read uh, the, the follow-up paper by, I believe it was Merlin Robb, uh, defining that, I, I can tell you that for sure IV drug users and MSM were at high risk, so it did not show uh, benefit in, in that group, but again, post hoc analysis. So, as, uh, well, I, I had, in, in Rochester, we work pretty closely with the community, and you know, after the STEPS trial, um, we really didn't expect this to work, so I wrote a, uh, uh, a um, op-ed for the newspaper about how, you know, we can learn from our failures and, and all that sort of thing. And lo and behold, they, I mean, there was that effect. And uh, the key now was to really see if we can uh, explain that. So this kind of large group of collaborators uh, got started on this and uh, doing a uh, uh, case control study, which is, which is in the literature. Um, so I won't go into it uh, too, too much. Um, uh, so chose a, a series of uh, assays um, and looked at uh, this number of, of subjects in, in their analysis. And again, the, uh, the, assay, uh, the PBMC's answer were pretty much uh, limited to that uh, uh, week uh, 26 uh, time point. So lo and behold, it uh, created a uh, uh, New England Journal uh, uh, article and 
uh, there were f six assays that, that uh, appeared to be related to um, uh, vaccine, vaccine, vaccine uh, efficacy. Um, in particular, uh, the one thing is uh, if IgA responses or uh, serum IgA responses against the, uh, the envelope were uh, elevated, then uh, some of these uh, correlates uh, went away, but if they were low, uh, they um, um, uh, were present. And so really the thing that's come out of this uh, probably most strongly has been the uh, V1B2 uh, epitope on GP120 uh, as a uh, potential uh, um, uh, benchmark we have more or less uh, in developing new vaccines. I'm going to just show you a few of the slides that uh, go further into this. Uh, the the um, level of uh, uh, the antibody level of these V1, T, V2 uh, vaccines affected uh, um, um, uh, acquisition. And if the levels were really high, you can see here that efficacy was judged to be uh, considerably uh, better. Um, and uh, again, vaccine efficacy uh, as a function of this uh, uh, intensity or, or magnitude of these V1, V2 uh, antibodies. And, uh, and then post hoc the post hoc analysis, looking at monoclonals of, of several of these things, uh, starting to identify some uh, potential mechanisms, ADCC uh, uh, antibody uh, activity. And, uh, um, and this work is really uh, still uh, ongoing. So back to the point that new antibodies can do something other than just uh, neutralize. CD, CD4 cell responses, particularly polyfunctional responses, were shown to also be associated uh, with uh, efficacy. And uh, Georgia Tamaris uh, uh, presented this at uh, R4P, and uh, this just gives you a, a flavor for the uh, number of things that have been uh, associated potentially with uh, the um, uh, result, uh, the mechanisms of potential protection from the study. Remember, this is all post hoc analysis. It's not according to the, the, uh, you know, the original intent of the study. This gives us clues. It's hypothesis generating. It's not hypothesis proving. But it's a uh, direction to go and things to look at with our uh, uh, future studies. I do want to point out this article here. If you read only one article, um, this, should, this should be the one that explains pr pretty much uh, all of these things just came out in uh, uh, immunological reviews, I believe it's January or February of this year. So if you want to spend time on, on one article rather than 20, uh, that would be a good one to, to start with. So when this uh, finding happened, we, you know, the, the thing was, well, how, how do we move forward? What, what do we, we need to do? And of course, this is a hypothesis generating. It's not true until confirmed in a uh, subsequent uh, trial. And uh, so people got together to try to uh, get these uh, uh, vaccines made uh, uh, with appropriate strains uh, for uh, Southern Africa uh, sites. So the idea was to just change the LVAC to uh, clade C, likewise make a bivalent uh, 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 subtype C uh, vaccine and then add a booster at 12 months at a time when the immune response has dropped off drastically. Well, easier said than done. Um, certainly you can make agreements and you can kind of work through uh, uh, these things, getting contracts. Uh, but kind of uh, the bottom line here, it took four years to produce these GP120 lots, which kind of reminds you again of the, the other side of the picture that we, we sometimes don't think about is, is real uh, product development and, and the kind of the whole motivation for Big Pharma to get involved in, in our work. And um, frankly, even, even though places like the VRC can fund you know, smaller phase 2B studies, you really need a, a big pharma partner to, to really move things uh, forward. And that's, that's not particularly uh, easy in all cases. So the follow-up study uh, was finally opened in uh, uh, November, I guess, of uh, last year. So this is kind of how it looked like. Uh, they in initially immediately did a follow-up study called HVT097, uh, which used the exact same vaccines and regimens in the South African uh, population intended to then move into when the vaccines were ready, 
uh, the phase, uh, I guess this would be a 2A study, uh, slightly larger with the actual vaccines to qualify to get to the uh, efficacy trial that we needed to, uh, to validate some of the findings from the Thai trial. So this is a, uh, uh, the, the design of, of the uh, 097. I won't say a whole lot about this. Pretty much matched uh, the um, uh, Thai trial. Uh, actually added also uh, uh, baseline uh, tetanus toxoid vaccines to identify whether immune responses uh, were more just due to good vaccine responders or so uh, than, than anything uh, particularly to do with uh, the vaccines themselves. But uh, so this is the results. Actually, in, in all these cases, this is uh, the uh, V1, V2 IgG responses, differences between 097 RV144. Pretty much all cases, you can see the percentage of responders in uh, 097 was as good or better and really the, the magnitudes were as good as, or better. So, so all looks uh, good there. Uh, and, and this is to the different uh, V1, V2s that uh, uh, were looked at. Um, okay, so uh, HVTN 100 began, uh, at 252 uh, participants. And these are ultimately what the, the vaccines uh, were, an envelope uh, ALVAC. Uh, with clade C, as I, I mentioned, it did have clade B, uh, uh, GP41, and GAG um, protease. And then also these are the strains that were selected for the, uh, the boost. And these are the five sites that uh, did this study in South Africa. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, uh, the, the results of this vaccine uh, trial did uh, qualify, it met all these uh, uh, criteria to move forward to the uh, uh, 702. Um, and that is the, the trial that's ongoing right now in, in South Africa to try to uh, uh, validate or, or confirm the findings of the Thai trial. Of course, this is a different population. Uh, it's um, it's, it's uh, a, um, HIV inf uninfected uh, men and women. Um, the transmission rate is uh, uh, most, uh, transmission is mostly heterosexual, but the transmission rate is much higher. We'll see if uh, this translates into efficacy or not, according to the finding of lack of protection among higher risk uh, individuals in the, the Thai trial. So uh, we've, this began relatively recently, I guess about four months ago. I think we've got about 350 volunteers uh, in. Uh, so consequently, we've got a long way to go on this. I believe it's uh, due to be filled midway through 2018 or something like that. And actually, this uh, helps me remember that, uh, the timeline of uh, when the, the trial should complete enrollment. Mm. Yeah, I think it'll be a little bit beyond uh, early uh, 2018 and then the follow-up. Mm. And if it doesn't get stopped for futility earlier, uh, expect results somewhere around uh, 2020. And this is a licensure uh, uh, study. It's, it's sponsored by uh, or helped uh, supported by the South African government. It's being uh, looked at only in, in South Africa at uh, a number of sites, uh, many of which are new to HIV vaccine work. And uh, Gates is co-funding and, uh, and the, as well as the NIH. So one thing that I'd like to say, just because it's a study that I led, so we're, we're gonna talk, well, actually that might be, uh, yeah, no, this is, this is a study that I was chair of and work with. Uh, I, I do a lot of kind of mentoring of junior investigators. So actually Nadine from Emory uh, was the co-chair of the study, but I uh, said, take it away, do the presentations and all that. So this is, this is a, uh, just a, uh, not rocket science, but it's a study of, of vaccines that were available. And to tell you the truth, uh, the use of DNA with protein boost has been very uh, rarely looked at uh, over the years in the HVTN or, or really in other groups, probably having to do with the fact that in the early days when protein was around, DNAs weren't yet optimized, and then proteins went away for a long period of time. DNA was optimized, and now we got uh, proteins back. So uh, Sean Liu is probably the one who's championed this uh, throughout even though it's taken him a long time to get his vaccines, uh, his proteins made. And, uh, you know, so there's only really a small number of people that uh, have been looked at uh, in the HIV vaccine field. So we decided to do a study 
uh, looking at uh, DNA boosted by uh, AIDS vax, the same AIDS vax from uh, the uh, Thai trial. And these don't line up, or you know, I'm not seeing it right, but T3 is the group that recapitulates the Thai trial design for DNAs with uh, two boosts of uh, GP120 at three and six months. And this is a co-administration of both at all four time points. This is just DNA followed by just protein boosts and just for kicks, even though there's not much to justify actually doing this, but we wanted to try protein first and, and DNA followed. And we did see that that didn't work very well. Uh, just one thing I want to show here, and um, you know, publications in progress and more data is coming out, but it was kind of surprising to us. Uh, this is v, V1, V2 responses at the peak time point to the uh, uh, C1086 uh, uh, isolate that's, that's been you know, shown to be the correlate in, in RV144. And uh, we got these pretty good uh, median uh, uh, magnitudes in these uh, antibody responses, either by the DNA, DNA uh, uh, followed by add uh, uh, or uh, by protein boost or giving all uh, simultaneously. So comparing these to the others, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think DNA and uh, protein uh, may make sense. And actually, there are several or two, two additional trials the HBTN is, is doing to look at these uh, combinations. Uh, I have been on a, uh, the Janssen safety committees for their program uh, for a number of years. They're, they're very, um, this is Dan Baruch's uh, 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 approach of ad 26 with mosaic inserts boosted by a, uh, what is a uh, oligomeric GP140 protein, both uh, clade C. Uh, we've just completed in the HVTN a, a trial with, with them. They're, they're very kind of, uh, intent on uh, keeping things quiet, it, it seems. I'm not exactly sure what I can say at this point, other than I can say that this is a major, uh, 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 major pharmaceutical company that is supporting uh, full go uh, all the way through from uh, what they're in now, phase 1B, uh, into uh, uh, phase 2B, or an efficacy trial within the next couple of years. So if I'm invited back to talk about this, uh, uh, I'll be able to say more about this next year, and I'll figure out exactly what it is I, I can say without getting into trouble. So, uh, lo and behold, I'm just about on time, amazingly enough. I'd, I'd like to really thank, uh, well, first of all, our, our network uh, it has all kinds of people that are really critical to the su success of the study. You know, volunteers, obviously investigators, uh, staff at the sites, um, staff at the, the core operations center, big labs, big stats, all, all that sort of thing. Uh, we pretty much value all of the, you know, the contributions uh, across the board, including our community advisory boards, which are really pretty important uh, in moving things forward uh, in, in uh, HIV prevention. Uh, slides, uh, I pulled some slides out of our uh, our uh, HV10 slide library, which is really nice. I don't have to make all these things. This is the article that I mentioned uh, Georgia and, and Stanley uh, uh, put out to uh, explain the complex uh, correlates uh, that were found in the, the Thai trial. Then I'd also like to put a plug in that if you really want to know more in depth, uh, R4P Research for Prevention, uh, hosted by uh, Tom Hope, who's probably around here somewhere, um, or maybe you already spoke, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, there's webcasts, and these, these are really good, good talks. So Georgia gives a talk, uh, um, and uh, I, I would encourage you, uh, often is the case, I like to kind of go back over things I've heard. So I, I think that, that's an ex excellent uh, way to kind of reinforce some of what uh, we've talked about today. So, my clock says I'm, I'm done, so I'm uh, happy to uh, take Questions? Thank you.